My name is Don Dixon and I want to welcome you and thank you for joining me today for our structure fishing workshop. Now today is an opening session of what's going to be about an eight or ten week lecture series that will include all the most important things you're ever going to need to know about the habits of a freshwater game fish and what it takes for you and me to catch them. Anytime you enter into a study on successful fishing, one of the first questions that most fishermen will ask is this study going to include my favorite species of fish? And every time I hear that, I'm reminded of a little quick story I'll share with you about Buck Perry uh, was doing a lecture one time at Fish and Facts magazine up in Wisconsin. I was with him. We were on a trip. And this was one of the things that he had to do up there. So he gave his little lecture. And as he would normally do at the end of that lecture, he opened it up for some questions and answers. So after Buck was finished with that lecture, during the question and answer period, uh, this one fellow spoke up and he said, Buck, I'd like to ask you, any chance that, that you're going to be developing a curriculum for all of the other different species? Obviously, he was a walleye fisherman. I'll never forget Buck's response. He said, Mister, if I were to try to do that, that would take probably four or five different lifetimes. <laughs> and he said, I only have one. So the quick answer to your question is no. I will not be doing that. But then he went on to explain that there's really no need for it either. After all of Buck's research, fishing 325 days a year for 30 years before I met him and for 20 years after I met him, he had come to the conclusion, put in its simplest terms, that a fish is just a fish. Water is water. All fish, all game fish react to weather and water conditions pretty much in the same way. They move about in the lake pretty much the same way. You really don't need to have a curriculum on all of the different species. So as we go into this study, keep in mind, a fish is just a fish and water is water. Now, our study fish is the largemouth, but there are some little idiosyncrasies between the species. And when we come to those areas of discussion where it's important that you know that difference. I'm going to be sure to tell you all about it. But when I'm talking about a fish in this study, I'm basically talking about largemouth bass and I'm not just talking about one largemouth bass. I'm talking about the school of adult sized largemouth bass. That's what we're chasing. And all of our study is built around locating and catching the school of fish. So we're going to begin this talk now today with the basic movements of fish. First thing we're going to have to come to grips with is that deep water is a home of the fish. I've been talking about it for a year. Buck talked about it for 70 years. I followed him behind and talked for the next 48 years about it. And it's still sort of amazing to me that somebody like Buck Perry, who went out with his brilliant mind, went about researching and proving his theory about a fish by fishing 325 days a year for 30 years before I met him and for about 20 years afterwards. He was just fishing all the time. And in all of that fishing, he fished all over the United States. He fished Canada. He, well, shoot, he fished, he fished the Atlantic. He fished uh, uh, the Pacific. He fished uh, Venezuela, he fished Costa Rica, he fished just about everywhere you could ever dream of. He's been fishing. And his whole idea was to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that his theories were correct. And in all of his travels, over all of those years, he was totally convinced in the end of it all that there was no doubt in his mind that deep water is the home of the fish. In fact, the school of big fish, all species, spend 90 to 95 percent of their entire adult life in deep water, somewhere in deep water. Now the amazing thing, to not only to Buck, but to me, he did all of that research for all of those years, you know, whether it was 20,000 days on the water, 
all different types of water, all different seasons of the year, all different species of fish. He had all of that research, successful research. And then he came along and started teaching me and I spent the next 30 years doing the same thing that he had done originally. Fishing all over the United States, Canada, all over the place 300 days a year. And never in all of that experience was Buck ever questioning that deep water was a home of the fish. Nor was I. I fished shallow for the first 15 years of my fishing. And once I met Buck, I started fishing deep. You can't even, I can't even begin to tell you the difference. I went to catching thousands of fish when before I caught about that many. But yet today, you yell and scream and talk, we got to begin our thinking with first accepting that deep water is a home of the fish. And if you don't accept that, you may as well turn off the camera. We may as well all go home because nothing I say from this point on will make any sense if you first don't accept that. Deep water is a home of the fish. Now, a lot of modern day fishermen will say, well, I, I believe that. I believe that's probably true. But when you see them going about their fishing, they're always fishing in the shallow water. Almost always. Not everybody, but almost everybody is fishing almost all the time in the shallows. When 90 to 95 percent of that fish's life is spent in deep water. So Buck always was perplexed as to why somebody would want to argue that point with him. So I don't believe that they live in deep water. Now here's a guy that's making that statement that probably like every other average fisherman, uh, their whole fishing world revolves around about a 50 mile radius of where they live. Doesn't make him a bad guy. You know, most people today are raising a family, raising children, and they have other activities like jobs, you know. They can't just be running off all over the place. They're not in the fishing business. By the way, I looked this up this morning. I wanted to know what the average is of all the fishermen who went fishing last year, what the average uh, time was spent on the water. They researched 33 million adult fishermen. And in other words, they left out the kids. You had to be over 16 to get into this little survey. And they found out that the average fisherman last year fished 17 days. At that rate, he'd have to fish 20 years to do what Buck did in one year. To do what I did in one year, as far as experience. But yet he wants to argue with the master. He wants to argue with Buck Perry. That he doesn't believe deep water is a home of the fish. Well, he's just lost. He'll never, ever become a good fisherman. He might be a great caster and all of the other above, uh, above. He might have all the best equipment, but he'll never be a good fisherman if he first doesn't accept deep water is a home of the fish. Now, once we get by there, once we get by that spot, the rest of this stuff just sort of all comes together and it becomes easy. So the next question comes up then, just how deep is this deep water home area? Well, uh, Buck's found that over all of his fish and all of the research that under normal weather and water conditions, the average depth, if this much water is available in your lake, uh, that the fish will take up housekeeping will be somewhere between 30 and 35 feet. This is a very important depth to remember in all fishing for a bunch of reasons, which we'll talk about in later study. But this is the average home area for the school of largemouth bass under normal weather and water conditions. Now, a couple of things we got to bring up about these fish being in deep water. First question is why? And, and I'm going to try to explain it because it's one thing to just make a statement about a fish, but it's another thing to explain why. And this is pretty simple. Fish are very adaptable creatures. They've proven over all of time that they're adaptable and can adapt to changes in the environment. Otherwise, if they couldn't, they'd all be gone and we wouldn't have a sport. But the point is they are very adaptable, but they can adapt quickly. So keep that in mind now, they can adjust quickly. Now that includes everything that makes up the fish's environment, oxygen, temperature, uh, light conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We go on and on and on of all of the different components that make up the fish's environment. 
they are changing. Not only year to year, month to month, day to day, hour to hour, sometimes Buck used to say they even change in minute to minute. And these fish, when there's a change, they can't just turn the light switch and adapt. The only way that they can adapt is to drop deeper. The reason for that is that all of these features of the environment that make up the environment of the fish, most all of them are absorbed in the first eight to ten feet of water, especially light, which is a real killer. It's absorbed mostly in the first eight to ten feet of water. By the time you reach that depth, that magical depth of 30 to 35 feet, even in the ocean, by the way, most all light is gone. All of a sudden, these fish, to get to a stable condition, had to just keep dropping deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until they reach the stability that comes at those depths. There is no stability up in the shallows. That's the reason big fish can't deal with it. They have a hard time. Now, there's something else I could bring up right here. The average life expectancy of a largemouth bass is six years. That's how long they live. One lives a little bit longer, it's just like a man or any other creature. They live a little bit longer than the next guy, but the average, six years. And the average weight in most of the country for that fish would be around five and three quarter pounds. That's sort of the last schooling size of largemouth. When you catch that outsized seven, eight pounder in most of the country, he'll be with that school of five and three quarters. But that is the last schooling size. And when you take a look at the growth of a fish, you figured by the time a fish got over two pounds, about three years into a fish's life, he starts really feeling it. And he's really reluctant to go shallow. The older a fish becomes, the tighter he will score and the more reluctant he is to move out of that deep water home area. Now, a couple of bad things happen here. I'm going to mention them right here. First of all, when the fish are downstairs, 30, 35 feet, in the, what Buck refers to as their sanctuary zone, sanctuary from the environment, when they're in that 30 to 35 feet, in any body of water, the deeper you go, the colder the water becomes. So at that depth, what you have is cold, cold water. And since fish are cold-blooded creatures, their body takes on the same temperature as the water. And the colder their environment, the slower their metabolism. They slow down. They become very, very slow, semi-dormant. Conversely, uh, the shallower they go, the warmer the water, the more active they become and the more frisky they are and the easier they are to catch. So that's bottom line about why it's so difficult at times catching fish when they're out there where they are 95% of the time in deep water. They're dormant. Sometimes in the sanctuary zone, it's nearly impossible to catch fish. And to make matters even worse, for most fishermen, now I'm talking about most fishermen, trouble begins, I'm going to use a little figure here to, sh to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Trouble begins for most fishermen at a depth of 15 feet. When you're talking about presenting lures, whether it be casting or trolling and being exact in your fishing, most of the time, trouble begins around 15 feet. I used the example not long ago when we were talking about presentation of lures. I used the example if I just drop my tackle box in uh, three feet of water and ask you to back up and throw some casts and hit that tackle box, you'd probably do it nine out of ten times. But if I throw that tackle box in 60 feet of water and say, now hit it. If I throw my tackle box in 35 feet of water and say, now hit it, it's a different story. Everything becomes more difficult in your presentation. It becomes more difficult to be exact. You're not quite sure where the lure is and so on and so forth. You're not looking at it. It becomes more difficult. So here's our negative situation. We got deep dormant fish where in order to catch one, we have to be so exact that we bring that lure right by his nose. Very difficult to do. He might want to chase a bait but he can't do it. His metabolism is slowed down to a point he just can't do it. That's nature. It's the way it is. So we've got deep dormant fish, hard to present lures, 
the next question then by most fishermen is, well, how in the heck are we going to catch them? If they spend most of their time, 90, 95% of their time out there in that deep water, and it's hard to fish deep successfully, and the fish are dormant, how the heck are we going to catch them? Now comes the good news. <laughs> My friends, we are saved due to the fact they don't stay there all the time. Once or twice on a normal fishing day, these fish will move and migrate towards the shallows. Actually, the way Buck says it is this. We're saved due to the fact that they may move towards the shallows. The reason he uses that word may move towards the shallows, that disclaimer, <laughs> I should say, is because sometimes the fish become active and don't actually migrate shallow, but become active in the sanctuary zone. This occurs. And it also occurs many times with walleye and some of the other species. However, the greatest majority of the time when the fish become active and move, they move towards the shallows. Now, we're saved again because this movement or migration is never in a haphazard fashion, but it's along well-defined routes, routes which the fish can see, and so can we. And these routes that they follow on their movements Buck referred to as structure. Buck coined the word structure. And by definition, structure is the bottom of the lake, the bottom of the lake, that's different in some respects from the surrounding bottom area. And that's what makes it visible to the fish. And that's what they follow on this movement or migration. Now, how far they go and how long they stay will be completely dependent upon the weather and the water conditions at that particular time. So as these fish move, keep in mind now, the older that fish becomes, and we're talking about these school fish, the older they become, the more reluctant they are to be shallow. But I'm going to show you the shallowest movement that we can expect to further define a basic movement of fish. But keep in mind, this is under excellent weather and water conditions. You hardly ever see the fish get this far, but let me take you through this basic movement now. We've got the fish moving all the way up to school of fish, all the way up to a depth of eight to 10 feet. And right there is where the big fish say, whoa, wait a minute, put on the brakes. We're getting too shallow and they stop they literally put on the brakes and at that point the smaller fish i know you've caught a lot of smaller fish in the shallows the smaller fish will move into this shallow water and occasionally a good fish occasionally a good fish will move in but the bulk of the big fish stop at that eight to ten feet they don't go any further and this is what Buck referred to as a scatter point. Let me explain something on a survival of the species. You know, bass will eat their own kind. So will all other game fish. They have no problem with that. So the way of it, nature's way of it, the smaller fish will always move first, they'll move further, and they'll stay longer. Because if they don't move, these big fish will make them lunch. Uh, so that explains why so often you'll find quite a few smaller fish in the shallows. And not only that, physically, they can stand it a lot better than the older fish. You know, it's kind of like I had a bird dog one time, my pheasant dog, she was great, and great on grouse too. She was an Irish setter. And when she was a pup, you couldn't hold that dog down. I mean, trying to train her took forever because she was so rambunctious. She was just, you know, she, and she had it in her nose, boy. She was, she was a great dog. But at age 15, I could rack that slide in the gun. I could put on all my hunting garb and crank up the truck, and she'd just sort of mosey on over. You know, where in the early days, that old tail was going like that. Fish are the same way. They get older. They get tired. They get different. They can't react. They can't adjust to their environment. So their answer is, the deeper they stay, the less uh, they have to adjust because all of those environmental conditions become stable at some point. 
Buck always said, what's the most important thing to talk about when you're talking about where the fish are located is stability. Where does a fish find stable conditions? That's where that fish is going to be. And like we talked about most of the time, that's 30, 35 feet. But on this movement, don't expect to see the school of fish moving in past that scatter point, which we're identifying now under the most excellent conditions you can find. That scatter point is eight to 10 feet, no shallower, that's it. And Buck told me this one time that in his 70 years plus out there running around fishing for that bass, in all of those years, he could count maybe once, twice, three times at the most where he caught more than one good fish beyond the scatter point bulk of the season. Now, we're not talking about the spawn now. We're talking about bulk of the season during the summer months. How many times did he find the school of fish shallower than 10 feet? He didn't. That's the answer. 20,000 days on the water, that ought to be enough to convince you. I don't want to spend all my time up there on that bank. I don't want to be sitting out here throwing in there all the time, period. It's not going to pay off in decent fish. Now, in my 30 years active, in the 18 semi-active, and all the water that I fished, all over this country and all over Canada, I can only remember two times when I caught more than one big fish beyond the scatter point during the summer months. Two times. I forget I estimate I've been on the water 10,000 days. Just doesn't happen. So when I see today's bass fishermen, now I'm not talking about all of them now, so don't give me them cards and letters and tell me that's not what you do. But the average people we see, I'll go out on, it doesn't matter what lake I'm on. If I see 27 big old bass boats, 26 of them are in throwing the shoreline. That's what they do. And it's so unfortunate. They just haven't accepted this very basic truth. Deep water is a home of the fish. They spend 90 to 95% of their time in that deep water. Fortunately for us, they do become active from time to time and move towards the shallows. And that could be anywhere between that scatter point, 12 feet, 15 feet, 17 feet, 20 feet, 22 feet, 25 feet, and be very active and very catchable, but we can't catch them if they're at 25 feet out there and we're in here throwing up to the next to the blade of grass on the bank, we can't catch them. They ain't there. Buck Perry's favorite statement of all time. He used, to, he used it all the time. He'd say, folks, we just can't catch a fish if we're fishing where the ain't. <laughs> He'd throw that out there in that North Carolina draw. We just can't catch a fish if we're fishing where the ain't. And Duh. Truer words were never spoken. So our job in fishing, really, is to find the where. Where are the fish? Well, shallows deep somewhere in between. Most of the time, they're deep somewhere in between. About the only time the school of big fish that I'm looking for are in the shallows is during the spawn. In the late fall, you can have some good movements of some of the bigger fish. Late fall or spawn. That's it. 95% of my fishing is the in-between water and the deep water. The reason? That's where the fish are. Now, are we always totally successful at catching a big school of fish every time we go? No. Sometimes the weather and water and our ability uh, isn't quite what it needs to be and so on and so forth. There are a lot of reasons to maybe not be real successful all the time. But I can promise you, if you're looking for the school of big fish and you keep casting that bank, other than the spawn, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. They're not there. And you can't catch fish where they ain't. So now, let's get back on that movement of fish. We got the school of big fish sitting there at 10 feet. And you hadn't caught anything on the, in the shallows all morning, but all of a sudden, bang, 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 bang. You catch like you and your buddy catch eight, nine, 10 fish in the shallows real quick and maybe one of them's a good fish like i said that's not likely occasionally but not likely bulk of the season but you catch a lot of these 
bang, 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 almost every cast. Well, an activity period has taken place. A movement of fish have taken place. And the truth of the matter is somewhere real close by on that bar sits a school of big bass. But you got to be turned around in the boat and out on the end of that bar throwing your baits, not casting into the bank. But those fish that you catch in a, right in a row, uh, eight or ten real quick, you catch them. Uh, that's where people say, well, we had a real good bite around 10 o'clock. Yeah. What they had was a good movement of fish. But they never got into the big fish because the big fish were deeper on that bar. Because they will not go beyond the scatter point, bulk of the season. Take it to the bank. Trust me on this one. And see if you don't start catching more and bigger fish. Now, once that activity period is over, in fact, let's touch on this while we're at it. People ask all the time, how long does this movement take place? When the fish move like that, how long do they stay there? That's going to be completely dependent on the weather and water. That's for another study that we're going to be doing later. But I can tell you to think in terms of minutes rather than hours. If you get a school of fish come up and sit on that bar for 30 minutes, that's a good movement of fish. Boy, you ought to limit out no problem on good fish. Sometimes it'll last 45 minutes. The biggest catch of uh, smallmouth I ever made, consecutive cast, uh, lasted about 50 minutes. Uh, the big catch of largemouth I made with that writer out in uh, Lake Arlington that I shared with you last year, uh, that took place in about 45 minutes. That's a terrific movement. You get them to stay up there for an hour, that's a great movement. It just doesn't last that long. So. That's the reason we, we spend so much time concentrating on the where in fishing. When that activity, we need activity to really be successful. We need those fish to become active. And what triggers this activity is a weather condition, which we're going to be talking about later study. But uh, when these fish become active and move, we can catch a ton of fish, 15, 20, 25 big fish, all in one movement of fish, we can catch that kind of a big limit of fish. However, if we're not in the right place when this movement occurs, we're going to be dead. We're going to be skunked. And that's what happens so often. People will be fishing and fishing and fishing and fishing, and all of a sudden something turns on and there's a bunch of fish caught. Now, if you're in the shallows, you're going to be a bunch of small fish with occasional good fish. But if you're doing what we talk about doing, if you're an educated structure fisherman and you're on structure when those fish move, man, you make catches, I swear, you, you won't believe it. It'll be so fantastic. The first 10 or 15 or 20 schools of fish I got into on the cast, on deep structure, when it was over, I was still doing the shaking. I was so excited. It was unbelievable to me. And all I really did was changed the where I was fishing. I was fishing the in-between in the deep water. I wasn't fishing the bank. Now sure, I always will check the shallows. But where you're running into the school of big fish, bulk of the season, is somewhere in between water and deep water. That's where they are. Now, when the movement period is over, the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it is, when the movement period is over, those fish will turn around and go back to their deep water sanctuary the exact same way they came. They follow the exact same bottom features back downstairs. And folks, that's how they've been doing it for thousands of years. Buck Perry just came along and proved it. That's what he refers to as a basic movement of fish. Now, with all that being said, I know I have a lot of people up in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, upstate New York. I've got a lot of people that are fishing natural lakes. And probably one of the questions on your mind is, well, how does the weed line affect this basic movement of fish? And we're going to be talking about that the next time we get together. So like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and be sure to subscribe to our channel. I hope that you're going to be with me throughout this entire study so that when spring breaks and the ice is gone, we're going to have a real successful year of catching a lot of big fish. So thanks again for being with me, and we'll see you the next time.